Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 11 of the OpenStax Psychology textbook. My name is Matthew Poole and today we're going over personality. So we're firstly going to define what personality is. So your textbook through OpenStax Psychology states that personality is the long-standing traits and patterns that propel individuals to consistently think, feel, and behave in specific ways. Now it comes from the Latin word persona which means a mask worn by an actor. Actor. And in ancient times, theatrical masks were used to represent slash project a specific personality trait. All right, so let's go through a little bit of history of um, personality perspectives. Now, firstly, we got to talk about France Gall in 1780 created what's known as phrenology. Okay, so phrenology is considered pseudoscientific, and pseudoscience quite simply means fake science. So he proposed that the distances between bumps on the skull reveal a person's personality traits, their character, as well as mental abilities. And over time, he was discredited for a lack of empirical support, because as we know now, you can't just measure the distances and fill the distances between the bumps on your skull and examine one's personality adequately. But it didn't stop him from trying to do so and being relatively successful early on with this particular quote-unquote field of study. Now another historical perspective includes Immanuel Kant in the 17th century. He agreed with Galen that individuals could be categorized into one of the four temperaments. So let's go through these four and let's see if you identify with either of the following. So Firstly, choleric or choleric, whichever way you like to pronounce it. These individuals are excitable, egocentric, they're ex exhibitionist, they are impulsive, histrionic, which means dramatic, as well as active. Now, sanguine, these individuals are playful, easygoing, sociable, carefree, hopeful, and contented. Now, for those who are more so phlegmatic, these individuals are are reasonable, principled, controlled, persistent, steadfast, and calm. When it comes to melancholic, a lot of us have heard of this word before, these individuals are more so anxious, worried, unhappy, suspicious, serious, and thoughtful. So in the comments, let me know if you identify with one of these four um, personality temperaments as identified by Immanuel Kant. Okay, moving forward. Now when it comes to psychodynamic perspectives we've got in the 20th century. We've got Sigmund Freud. We've all heard of at least Sigmund Freud uh, when it comes to psychology once in our life before. So what Freud thought is that uh, the first comprehensive theory of personality explaining both abnormal and abnormal behaviors. He, uh, he had that first comprehension of theory of personality. Now he proposed that unconscious drives influenced by sex, aggression, and childhood sexuality and experiences influence your personality. Remember, Freud is an individual who thinks that who you are is a result of unconscious processes as well as earlier childhood experiences. He thinks that your personality tends to be set in stone by the time you reach adolescence through a series of stages of a psychosexual development. And whenever there's difficulties in one of those stages, that can lead to the fruition of mental difficulties. Now, neo-Freudians, aka just new Freudians, they agreed that childhood experiences matter, but they put a less emphasis on sex and more so focused on social environment and the effects of culture on personality. So how does your environment, your nurture, impact who you are uh, at, when it comes to personality? Okay, let's talk about Freud's psychodynamic perspective. Now, again, as I already mentioned, he thinks that you have what's known as an unconscious mind. So these are mental activities that we are unaware of and don't have access to. These are the things that influence us without us really knowing in day-to-day -day situations. Okay, and according to Freud, these are not my words, this is Freud. He thinks that we really only have about one-tenth of access to our minds, kind of similar to this iceberg over here where uh, m most of the iceberg is underwater and you can't see it, and the little bit that you can see is above water, and that's what we can access. 
He also says that unacceptable urges and desires are kept in our unconscious mind through repression. Okay, because apparently these unacceptable urges and desires are not socially acceptable. Now, the information in our uh, unconscious does affect our behavior, although we are aware, unaware of it. That's something that I can uh, agree with. There are things, mental faculties in day-to-day -day moments that we are not, that we can't access that influence who we are. Now, some of us have heard before what's known as a Freudian slip. Now, a Freudian slip, according to Freud, he's a big determinist, so there's no mistakes. Everything happens for a reason, and there are prior causes for those reasons, okay? And so Freud suggests that slips of the tongue, whenever you accidentally say something that you um, didn't mean to, are um, urges that are accidentally slipping out of our unconscious. It's not that they are a mistake, it's that you know, it's our unconscious mind slipping through and that we did mean it or there's some sort of meaning behind it for whatever reason that may be. Okay, so Freud also has the concept of what's known as an id, ego, and superego. He thinks that when you have a balanced id and superego, that will develop into a healthy personality. Whenever there's an imbalance between the two, this can lead to neurosis or the tendency to experience negative emotions such as anxiety disorders or unhealthy behaviors. So to break this down and to put it maybe a little bit more relatable to you, the id is like the devil on your shoulder. It relies on the pleasure principle. It what's it wants what it wants when it wants. Now, your super ego um, is that angel on your shoulder. You've seen these in movies and TV shows where you got the devil on your shoulder and the angel on your shoulder that pops up. And the super ego wants to do right all the time uh, at every moment. And so what the ego comes in and does, and like in the movies and TV shows, that you and the sinner are having to decide and distinguish between the two. And the ego relies on the reality principle. So how can we uh, do what's socially acceptable by the superego, but while also satisfying the id? So he's trying to compromise, or the ego is trying to compromise between the two. All right, so let's talk about defense mechanisms. So this is a really important part of the chapter, but in the course in general. Defense mechanisms are unconscious protective behaviors that work to reduce anxiety. And they're an ego protector, so we don't necessarily realize that we're engaging in them until we're made known of the fact. Okay, they're ego protectors. So firstly, we have what's known as denial. This is whenever we refuse to accept reality because it makes us uncomfortable or because it's unpleasant. So in the example to the right, Kayla refuses to admit that she has an alcohol problem, although she is unable to go a single day without drinking excessively. And so although the indications of an alcohol use disorder are there, they are refusing to accept reality because they don't want to quit drinking and they don't want to believe that they have an alcohol problem. Displacement. So displacement is whenever we take unacceptable urges or frustrations and we cast them onto a less threatening target. Okay, so an example of this could be like your boss is being a jerk to you and you can't take out what you want to say uh, on, on or what you want to do on your boss because that will lead to um, a difficult situation such as losing your job and subsequently losing your ability to earn a paycheck and pay your bills. So what individuals may do as a result, unfortunately this happens, is they will come home and take it out on their family or their friends because that's a less threatening target. It's not going to lead to that much of a lifestyle change as a result of taking those unacceptable urges and putting them onto a less threatening target. Okay, this happens really often. Projection. Projection is that whenever we take unacceptable feelings or desires about ourselves and we put them onto other people. So in the example to the right, Chris often cheats on her boyfriend because she suspects he is already cheating on her. So um, in this case, what Chris is doing is she is actually engaging in the act of cheating, but she may either blame Chris or accuse Chris of cheating or think that or excuse me think that their partner is cheating so they just do it anyways but in all reality their partner is not actually cheating they just believe it to be true and she's casting feelings about herself onto her partner and this happens too I see with people who are jealous of others 
and they will, uh, like for example, one individual may see another posting on social media and getting a lot of attention, and that person says, well, that person is just a, an attention seeker. They just want to be seen by others, and uh, it's ridiculous that they get the attention that they do. But take a second and take a, a, a step back and say, well, is that something that that person actually wants? They're just jealous of the other person for getting it. They just they you with that person wishes that they could post more and have the attention that the other person is receiving. It's important to really see and listen to other people and see how they talk about others because it may signal information about themselves and they're just casting it on onto other people through jealousy. So projection is taking feelings about yourself and putting them onto other people. Rationalization. This is whenever we uh, justify behaviors by substituting acceptable reasons for less acceptable real reasons. So for the example to the right, Kim failed his history course because he did not study or attend class, but he told his roommates that he failed because the professor didn't like him. Obviously, that's likely not the case. Professors, for the most part, I'm not saying this can't happen, but professors, for the most part, uh, remain as objective and unbiased as they possibly can. They don't just seek out failing people just to fail them. But a lot of us may rationalize that what is actually happening and, and substituting those um, acceptable reasons for less acceptable ones. Maybe you're just not studying as much as you, as you could be, right? And um, there are a number of examples that can fit under rationalization, such as for people who engage in substance use and abuse uh, consistently. And they will consume the substance because, well, it makes me more social or it calms me down and I can operate... Uh, as I would like to, or it motivates me. I'm more productive on this substance. When in reality, they're just substituting uh, real reasons in that they just have a substance use uh, difficulty for uh, less, for acceptable reasons. So uh, for less acceptable reasons, just saying that, you know, well, it makes me much better uh, and able to operate at a better level. Reaction formation. Reaction formation is whenever individuals engage in, engage in reducing anxiety by adopting beliefs contrary to their own. So have you ever been in a situation where the group has a particular ideology or agreement, they're talking about something in particular, but you don't necessarily agree with it, however, you still go along with it and you still agree with them? to go along with social harm, harmony because you're reducing that anxiety in the moment so you can, um, uh, or you're adopting beliefs contrary to your own just so you can reduce that anxiety momentarily just to get you by. I know plenty of people who do this in, in uh, uh, topics just to try and um, be at an even state and try not to rock the boat. This commonly will happen with people who are pretty agreeable. Okay, regression. This is whenever we return to coping strategies for less mature states of development. So, for example, after failing uh, to pass his uh, doctoral examinations, Giorgio spends his day in bed cuddling his favorite childhood toy. Um, and other people, whenever something happens to them in life, they don't get what they want. They may engage in adult temper tantrum. They act out in a less mature state instead of just dealing with their emotions on their own time. And with the help of a therapist, they just uh, they don't exactly know what to do. So they engage in childlike or less mature states to cope with the situation. Repression. So this is whenever we suppress painful memories and thoughts. Uh, so Lashea, she cannot remember her grandfather's fatal heart attack, although she was present. Because the brain has a, a tendency to suppress information that is traumatic or painful so as to protect you. Okay, So some memories for some people may become fragmented or forgotten altogether because the brain is just suppressing those painful thoughts and memories. And lastly, sublimation. So sublimation is whenever we redirect unacceptable desires through socially acceptable channels. So this is the most healthy and productive defense mechanisms. So, for example, uh, Jerome's desire for revenge on the drunk driver who killed his son is channeled into a community support group for people who have lost loved ones to drunk driving. So J Jerome, although as much as he wants to get back at this person for... Um, 
you know, killing his, his son through uh, a drunk driving incident. He could go off and do a number of other things that are not productive, but he channels it into awareness. Um, a lot of people too, they'll <clears throat> if they have frustrations or unacceptable urges, they'll go and take it out at the gym. So redirecting unacceptable urges and putting them into more productive and socially acceptable channels. Okay, let's talk about some neo-Freudians or new Freudians and their perspectives and their theories of personality. So we're going to talk about uh, Erickson, Carl Jung, and uh, a couple others potentially if we've got time. Now, we've got with Carl Jung. You can thank Carl Jung for um, adopting or introducing to us introversion versus extroversion. A lot of us have already heard about introverts versus extroverts before. And if you've taken things like the Myers-Briggs personality test, which I recommend you doing, uh, you will kind of find out your spectrum of if you're an introvert versus an extrovert. Now, introverts, they are very much energized by being alone. They tend to avoid attention. They speak slowly and softly. They think before they speak. They tend to stay on one topic and prefer written communication. On top of this, they also pay attention easily and are very much cautious. So your extroverts, alternatively, they are energized by being with others. They love to be in a group and seek out jobs that are more so social. They tend to seek out attention, speak quickly and loudly. They will think out loud, so they don't necessarily think uh, as much before speaking comparatively to introverts. They jump from topic to topic, prefer verbal communication, so actually being face-to-face -face or just hearing uh, the voice of another person on the phone. They're distractible and then they act first, think later. So that's one of the main differences between introverts versus an extrovert. extrovert. So what are you? Let me know in the comments. Okay, learning approaches. Let's talk about Julian Rotter and um, locus of control. I think more so what we're going to do is get uh, talk a little bit more about Erickson and the other theorists um, as noted in the previous slide and other chapters. So we'll get to that at uh, different parts. But let's talk about Julian Rotter and locus of control. So your locus of control is your belief about how much power you have over your life. Now, this can be broken down into two different locuses of control, internal versus external. So if you have an internal locus of control, you do believe that you have free will, that you can make the most of your outcomes as the direct result of your own efforts. Okay, These people tend to perform better academically, achieve more in careers, are more independent, healthier, and less depressed. Because if you believe that you can dictate the outcomes in your life, uh, that is tends to be more productive of a thought process. Now, if you have an external locus of control, you tend to think that beliefs are a result uh, of things outside of your control. Well, if my behavior is a result of either my genetics, which I didn't choose, my environment, which I didn't choose, or randomness, then how much control do I really have in my life? It doesn't seem like this world is set up for free will. So these people think that things are outside of their control. So, you know, uh, things are going to happen the way they're supposed to happen. It's, it's not really due to my own choice. So they, again, believe that their lives are controlled by other people, luck, or chance. Let's look at some humanistic approaches with Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers. So when it comes to the humanistic approaches of Maslow and Rogers, so Maslow studied people he considered healthy, creative, and productive, and he found that they shared similar characteristics, that these people who are considered healthy, creative, and productive are more open, creative, loving, spontaneous, compassionate, uh, are concerned for others, and are accepting of themselves. So again, the humanistic approach, they believe in the potential for good that is innate to all of us. So they think that it, it's in us, it just needs to be facilitated out of us. So Rogers identified that there are two senses of self, the ideal self versus the real self. And if you're a part of my class, this is something that may potentially be on your test. So your ideal self is the person you would like to be. That's why you're in college taking the classes that you are or you're stumbling upon this for personal reasons and you want to learn more about personality in general. So you're 
trying to take some pieces and turn it into the person that you would like to be. For, for a lot of people, it's to get this credit so they can apply it to their degree and become a nurse, a doctor, lawyer, teacher, whatever the case may be. Whereas your real self is the person you actually are today. Who are you today? That's you your real self. So whenever there's a high congruence between your real self and your ideal self, there's a greater sense of um, self-worth and a healthy, productive life. Whenever there's a significant incongruence, there's a maladjustment. I know a ton of people who constantly throughout their life, there's an incongruence between who they actually are and their ideal self. Whenever somebody, let's say that they're a teacher, which is still an admirable career. I'm a teacher. I love it. It's very fulfilling. The pay may not be as great as other professions, but if I constantly go to work every day and just wish that I was a doctor or a lawyer and there's that big incongruence between the two that can lead to negative outlooks and for obvious reasons and maladjustment. Okay. Let's talk about the five factor model. So we're going to talk about some personality assessments. This is considered by personality psychologists as the gold standard of personality assessments. There are others that I find pretty adequate, such as already mentioned the Myers-Briggs, as well as the Enneagram. I encourage you to take those. They're free online. You just search them up on Google and they should pop up pretty automatically. Now, when it comes to the five factor model, this particular model tests you on five distinct traits. Openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So for and you score either high or low in these different traits. Now if you score low in openness, you're more so practical, pr uh, conventional, and you prefer routine. If you score high in openness, you're more curious, have a wide range of interests, and are more independent. Now, if you are score low in conscientiousness, this means that you are impulsive, careless, and disorganized more so. Comparatively to scoring high, which will include people who are hardworking, dependable, and organized. When it comes to extroversion, these people, as we've already talked about, are outgoing. They seek attention. They seek adventure. They're pretty warm. Now, for those who score low in extroversion, they're more so quiet, reserved, withdrawn, and prefer to work on their uh, work by themselves. For those who score high in agreeableness, these people are more helpful, trusting, empathetic, go along with social harmony, um, and those who score low in it are more critical, uncooperative, suspicious. They like to debate, to disagree, and things like that. They like to question a lot. Okay. Neuroticism. This isn't, whenever I say neuroticism, this doesn't mean that you inherently have uh, mental uh, difficulties. It just means that if you score low in it, you're more calm, even tempered, and secure. But if you score high in it, you have the propensity for experiencing uh, anxiety, being prone to negative emotions, as well as unhappy. It doesn't mean that you're crazy. People uh, misuse the word neurotic pretty frequently and think that it just means cr that you're crazy, but that's not the case. Just more so prone to negative emotions. All right, we're going to finish on talking about cultural understandings of personality through global and regional differences, as well as the difference between individualist and collectivist cultures. In chapter 10, which I encourage you, if you haven't already watched it, to go and watch that video, uh, we distinguish a little bit more whenever it comes to the expression of emotions and the difference between an individualist or a me culture versus a collectivist culture, aka a we culture. So when it comes to your culture as it pertains to the understandings of personality, culture is one of the most important environmental and factors that influences who you are, those long-standing traits that propel you to consistently think, feel, and behave. So to define culture, these are the beliefs, customs, arts, and traditions of a particular society. Are personality traits the same across cultures or are there variations? So there are both universal and cultural specific aspects that account for variations in personality. So for example, Asian cultures, they're more collectivistic. So they're more about the uh, we uh, rather than the me. So they tend to be less extroverted. They're more introverted individuals. All right. And in Central and South American cultures, they tend to score higher on openness to experiences. And now in European cultures, they tend to score high in neuroticism. So they're more prone to negative emotions. So that intrigues me 
a good bit. But getting a little bit more micro, especially here in the United States, we, I mean, we are a very big country comparatively to all the others in the world. And so as a result, depending on your region in the United States, that can influence your personality. Now, if it doesn't as much influence your personality, what we see the trends uh, shifting to is that whenever individuals become adults and they're more established, they will move to different regions of the country that more so fit their personality traits. But for those that we can identify, whenever it comes to uh, cluster one, these people are more so at the, um, you know, they're uh, more so in the upper Midwest and deep South. So for those who are in the in these two uh, regions, they're more friendly and conventional individuals. Uh, they always like we always like to say Southern hospitality. And depending on where you're watching in the, this in the world, if you're not already clicked off because my Southern accent is unbearable. Um, I'm from the South, and I do tend to notice that there is such a thing as Southern hospitality that's not experienced in other regions of the country. And that's okay. It's not that people, if you go to the North, that people are meaner. It's that they're more direct. They, they mean well, and they're kind. They just show it and express it verbally in a different way. Nothing wrong with that. Now, for those who uh, reside in the West, so that's California, Oregon, you know, uh, Arizona, Nevada, things like that, they uh, are more so emotionally stable and creative individuals as well as relaxed, maybe because it's warmer out that way comparatively, comparatively to up north, uh, except more so towards Oregon. I'm sure in uh, Oregon and um, uh, I, don't, I don't think Washington is a part of that cluster, but more so Idaho and things like that. Now, for those who reside in the Northeast, you can see a distinct difference there where these individuals are more temperamental, un, un, uh, inhibited, things like that. So they are more likely to be stressed and irritable and depressed, maybe again because it's colder there more frequently throughout the year. All right. Now, let's talk about individualist versus collectivist cultures. When it comes to individualist cultures, here in the United States, we're very much a me culture. We value independence. We value competition and personal achievement. Okay, People display more personally orient oriented personality traits. All right. And when it comes to collectivist cultures, more so in the eastern part of the world, this includes Asia, Africa, and even in South America. So South America is more so uh, West, but still they're included in this. We've noticed that they're more so collectivistic. They value social harmony, respectfulness, and the group's needs over the individual's needs. So what does the group need before me? Whereas here in the United States and England and Australia, it's more so let me take care of myself and then potentially help other people. Um, uh, I'm not going to say that that's inherently selfish, but we do value individual competition rather than the success of a group but that's not uh, that's separate from engaging in sport activities. That's uh, that's uh, a different you know environment or agency altogether. We're just talking about the culture in general. Okay, let's end on talking about projective tests, uh, more so specifically focused on the um, Rorschach inkblot test. So the Rorschach inkblot test is a projective test, and as we've already defined in the defense mechanisms, and we've talked about the uh, Rorschach inkblot test in previous chapters, this is whenever we take feelings about ourselves and we cast them onto the image. So in a way, what they were trying to do, if I didn't explain it thoroughly enough in uh, previous chapters, it's not that the individuals are supposed to see a particular thing, but individuals who are delivering the Rorschach inkblot test, they're trying to find the common patterns that are able to access the unconscious mind. Because when you're projecting, again, it's a, de it's a defense mechanism wherein you um, may not realize that you're engaging in them until you do. So because we are accessing maybe a more so unfiltered part of your mind and you're placing what you're seeing onto the image, we can make connections as to uh, what may be going on behind the scenes, such as uh, impulses, feelings, as well as general desires. Okay, so that's going to end Chapter 11, Personality. Uh, I hope to see you in chapter 12 as we're going to dive into social psychology. I'll see you in the next one.